commonly called Chaturi. And the title is The Expressive Power of Planar Flows. Let me first introduce the background of normalizing flows. A normalizing flow is a kind of deep generative model. Here is a figure that illustrates these flows. Suppose we have a random variable z0 with density p0. It's called the source distribution or the input distribution. And we can use an invertible transformation to transform it into another random variable z1 and then apply an invertible f2 to transform into z2. And finally, we have zk with density pk. This is called the target distribution or the output distribution. And pk is written in f, the number sign, p0, which I will read as f over p0. It can be computed by the Jacobian of f, where f is composed of k simple, invertible, and parameterized transformations. When we have a bunch of data, we can, we can solve the MLE problem and obtain a generative model with computable likelihood. In this work, we focus on a basic kind of normalizing flow called planar flows in the following form where u, w, z are vectors, b is a real number, and h is a nonlinearity, just like those activation functions in neural networks. We hope to understand the expressive power of these flows. So here is the setting. Suppose f is composed of t planar flows. Suppose q is a source distribution and p is a target distribution. We hope to answer the following two questions. First exact transformation. When does it satisfy that p is equal to f over q almost everywhere? And second, approximation. Given small epsilon, is there a bound and a number of layers t such that f over q approximates p in our norm or in total vari variation distance to within epsilon? Now, you might want to ask, we have a lot of theoretical work on neural networks, say universal approximation properties for very wide networks or very deep networks. Why do we have to do this? I will say this is a different problem. Here is the challenge. A normalizing flow is an invertible function. Suppose f is a function class and i is a set of all invertible functions. Even if f is a universal approximator in the function space. It does not imply that its invertible subset can transform between arbitrary distributions. For instance, suppose f is a set of piecewise constant uh, trans functions. But it's a universal approximator, but a piecewise constant function is not invertible, so it doesn't have an invertible subset. On the other hand, even if f has limited expressivity, that is, f is not a universal approximator, it could still happen that its invertible subset can transform between arbitrary distributions. Say, f is a set of all increasing triangular functions. This is a very small subset of all functions in a function space, which is not a universal approximator, but it, can, it was proved that it can transform between arbitrary distributions. So the conclusion is the expressive power of f in a function space does not imply the expressive power of its invertible subset in transforming distributions. So instead of looking at f, we directly look at the input-output distribution pairs. And here are our results. For the one-dimensional case, we show that planar flows is a universal approximator in transforming distributions. When a nonlinearity h can be arbitrary, the proof is trivial. When we restrict it to the ReLU and the input distribution is a Gaussian, the conclusion still holds and the proof is not trivial. For the high-dimensional settings, we provide some negative results for planar flows of moderate depth. For the exact transformation question, we developed a topology matching condition, which is a necessary condition that the input-output 
distribution pairs must satisfy. We use these conditions to, to prove that for a certain number of planar flows, you are unable to transform between even very simple distributions, say mix of Gaussian distributions, product distributions. We also compare to radial flows, which is another kind of simple flow. For the approximation question, we developed a lower bound on the number of layers T for local planar flows, which is a specific kind of planar flows, including nonlinearities like uh, tangent age or sigmoid. And this is like the first lower bound in this area. That's it. Thank you. If, you, if, you, if you're interested, please come to my post or come to me. Yeah, thanks. OK. Hi, I'm Daniel Kenyon. Uh, I'm a first year grad student at Stanford University working with Surya Ganguly. And I'll be presenting work I did last year along with John Bloom, Alex Gueva, and Cotton Seed at the Broad Institute. Um, so the project grew out of an extremely simple question. What does a linear autoencoder learn? And what doesn't a linear autoencoder learn? So for this talk, we'll be considering a data matrix X with positive and distinct real, uh, singular values, a linear encoder W1, which maps data in RM to a representation in RK, and a linear decoder W2, which takes that representation in RK and maps it to a reconstruction RM, and trained this loss on, uh, or and the loss we'll be considering is the squared Euclidean distance between X and its reconstruction. So what does a linear autoencoder learn? Uh, as we know by the accurate Young theorem, the best low rank approximation to a matrix is given by its truncated singular value decomposition. In the case when x is mean centered, the left singular vectors here are going to be the principal directions. And so if we parameterized our encoder, or if we parameterize our model by the product w2, w1, uh, then we know the best that it's going to do is project into the top k principal subspace, and so therefore, and w2, w1 will be the orthogonal projection matrix. Um, so while we know that the optimal projection matrix, neither w1 nor w2 uh, is uniquely defined. Given an optimal w1 and w2, all other minima are obtained by composing w1 with an invertible matrix G and w2 with G inverse. And thus, the loss function of a linear autoencoder is invariant under this action of the group of invertible k by k matrices. So in summary, while linear autoencoders learn the subspace spanned by the principal directions, they cannot learn the individual directions or the eigenvalues due to this invariance. So given this, uh, we were surprised when we found a 2018 preprint that demonstrated empirically it actually was possible to recover the principal directions of x through the SD, uh, SVD of the weights of a trained linear autoencoder. Since the SVD is uh, not invariant under the general linear group, how could this be possible? And we hypothesized that this could only be true theoretically if we explicitly added L2 regularization to the encoder and decoder separately. Notice that this loss is now not only this loss is now not invariant under the general linear group, but is under the orthogonal group. And conveniently, under the orthogonal group, uh, the SVD structure is preserved. And even more surprising, when we look through the literature of autoencoders from Baldi and Hornick to Bengio, we didn't see anyone that had characterized this loss landscape. So we looked at the simplest setting, the scalar case, where W1, X, and W2 are all scalars. In this setting, finding the critical points and the trajectories is just calculus. And conveniently, we can also visualize this, uh, which is nice. So, uh, as you can see, for in the unregularized linear autoencoder, the minima are defined by hyperbola, and as expected, this, uh, these minima are uh, uh, diffeomorphic to the general linear group, which in one dimension is just all non-zero real numbers. When we add L2 regularization, we are effectively adding a paraboloid centered at the origin, folding up the hyperbola, resulting in two unique minima. And again, as expected, the minima are now diffeomorphic to the orthogonal group, which in one dimension is just plus or minus one. However, notice if we add enough regularization, then the weight decay dominates the reconstruction, and the critical points collapse to a single minimum at the origin. From this intuition, we generalize the critical points to the general matrix case. And there's three really important takeaways. The first is that all critical points in this setting are characterized by a set of at most k principal directions. There's also singular value shrink. All critical points have singular, uh, singular value shrinkage. And interestingly, the shrinkage is similar to that seen in probabilistic PCA. And we actually proved directly that these critical points coincide with those of probabilistic PCA. 
And then third, and maybe most importantly, at all critical points, the encoder and decoder become transposes. This intriguing phenomenon has important implications for biologically plausible pseudo-gradients, where it is assumed the transpose operator is not feasible. Um, so through linear algebra, we were able to characterize the critical manifolds. But to understand the trajectories between these manifolds, we turn to tools from algebraic topology, and in particular, Morse theory. Just as the Cartesian plane is not the right space to understand distance on a globe, Euclidean space is not the right space to understand the autoencoder or PCA problem. Instead, we consider the Grassmannian, which is the space of all k-dimensional linear subspaces in Rm. So for example, if we again consider our problem in R2, um, now linear subspaces are just single, uh, single points in the Grassmannian GR1 of 2. And in this space, it's clear that there are two unique critical points for the two principal directions, uh, a minimum and a maximum. And there's two trajectories between these critical points, either a counterclockwise or clockwise rotation. From this, we can generalize this idea to higher dimensions to understand the dimension of ascending and descending trajectories between critical manifolds of the autoencoder loss. Uh, in addition to looking at considering adding L2 regularization on the encoder and decoder separately, we also considered L2 regularization of their product and explained how these losses have direct interpretations, this one, and explained how they have direct interpretations to linear contractive and linear denoising autoencoders respectively. And then a recent paper uh, applied a very similar analysis to ours to explore the variational autoencoder in the linear setting, and they noticed connections also to probabilistic PCA and posterior collapse, similar to how when we saw when lambda increased beyond this, the singular values, then there was a collapse of the minima to just the origin. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, this work uh, explored a very simple model, deeply and thoroughly. And in doing so, I think we discovered some interesting phenomenon and connections to other models. Thank you. Uh, my name is Omar, and uh, I'll talk about recent joint work with uh, Steve Haneke and my advisor, Nati Srebro. Uh, we study a basic question, which is how can we learn predictors that are robust to adversarial perturbations at test time? So the setup is as follows. We have an instance space X, and uh, think of this as the space of images, and we have two labels, plus and minus. We model adversarial perturbations as a map U that maps X to a set of uh, allowed perturbations that can be chosen by the adversary at test time. Uh, we can look, we consider like uh, different classes of like perturbation sets. So each point in the space X uh, comes attached with a perturbation set. And this could be an L infinity ball around X, an L2 ball around X, or maybe just some other arbitrary set. W once we have this model of uh, adversarial robustness that we want to achieve, our main object of interest is the robust risk. The robust risk of a predictor H uh, on a distribution D is defined as the probability over samples x, comma uh, y drawn from d that there exists a perturbation z in, inside the set u of x where the classifier h makes a mistake. So in other words, a predictor h is robust on x, comma y if and only if it labels every point uh, in the every perturbation in the set u of x with the label y. So now, given a class of functions H uh, that contains predictors uh, that map from X to Y, we want to know whether it's possible to learn from a finite sample a predictor that competes with the best robust predictor in the class. Uh, more formally, we say a class of functions H is robustly pack learnable with respect to U if for all epsilon there exists a sample size and a learning rule that, uh, such that for any distribution, the, the learning rule will uh, succeed in uh, outputting predictor that is at most epsilon worse from the best robust predictor in our class H. So now with this definition in mind, um, we want to know which classes of functions can we robustly pack learn. In particular, can we robustly pack learn hypothesis classes with the finite VC dimension? So how can we ensure that the population robust risk is small? Well, a standard approach that one would think of is once we receive a sample S from the distribution, let's just minimize the robust uh, loss on the data, on our training data. So let's just pick a predictor H in the class that minimizes the robust loss. And there is recent work that studies computational approaches to solve this problem, as well as uh, uh, work that, try, uh, that establishes generalization guarantees through uniform convergence of the robust risk. However, in practice, there is uh, empirical evidence that suggests that uh, the robust risk 
might not concentrate as well as the standard risk. And there can be big gaps between the robust uh, training error or the robust training accuracy and the robust test accuracy. So our first main result, we show that there is a very simple hypothesis class H with VC dimension one, where we don't have uniform convergence of the robust risk, no matter how large of a sample uh, that we draw from the distribution. Uh, more strongly, we show that robust ERM can't robustly pack learn this class H, even in the realizable case, where we know that there is a predictor uh, in the class that is perfectly robust. We even show that no proper learning rule can robustly pack learn this class of functions H. And by proper learning rules, we mean any learning rule that is constrained to outputting predictors in the class. So you can think of this as any learning rule of the form that minimizes some empirical functional on the data by picking some predictor in the class H. So does this mean that all hope is lost and we can't really do robust back learning? Um, surprisingly, we show that it's uh, possible to do robust back learning. We just need to be improper. So uh, more formally, we show that for any uh, VC class, any hypothesis class with finite VC dimension, and any adversary U, there is an improper learning rule that can robustly pack learn H. In particular, we find that allowing the learning rule to output a predictor that takes majority votes over uh, predictors in the class can give us much stronger guarantees. So I'll briefly describe uh, a sketch of the approach for the improper learning rule. So we'll focus on the realizable case, where we know that the, there is a predictor H in the class that is perfectly robust. Once we receive a sample S from the distribution D, um, we will inflate it to a potentially infinite set. This, this set includes the original points plus the set of all uh, allowed uh, perturbations. Now this set is potentially infinite, so we can't really uh, deal with it, but we show that in a second step, it's possible to discretize this set such that we retain only the original points plus a finite number of perturbations such that it's enough to just get zero loss on this discrete set and forget about the potentially infinite set. Now once we have this discretized set, we feed it to a modified boosting procedure that uses robust ERM as a weak learning. And our final output is basically a majority vote over predictors that were outputted by robust ERM. Uh, we establish a robust uh, generalization guarantee through sample compression schemes, and this is based on recent amazing work by Moran and Yehudayev and Haneke Kondorovic and Sadegarsky. And uh, for the agnostic case, we show that it can be reduced to the realizable case via an approach by David, Moran, and Yehudayev. So with this in mind, uh, th the picture now is as follows. For uh, standard pack learning, we know that proper learning, in particular with ERM, is always uh, possible, and it's enough, uh, information theoretically. But for robust learning, in this, in this work we show that sometimes we really need to be improper. In terms of uh, characterizing learnability, in standard pack learning we know that the VC dimension is necessary and sufficient. Finite VC dimension is necessary and sufficient. Uh, for robust pack learning, uh, we know uh, in this work we show that finite VC dimension is sufficient, but there is a simple construction that shows that it's not necessary for robust learnability. And so an open question here is, what are necessary and sufficient conditions for robust pack learning? In terms of sample complexity, uh, uh, we know in standard pack learning the VC dimension exactly characterizes the sample complexity. But uh, in this work for robust learning, we show that the sample complexity is upper bounded by the VC dimension times uh, another complexity measure, which is the dual VC dimension. And this is, in the worst case, uh, exponential in VC dimension. Uh, however, we don't have a matching lower bound. And so an open question here is, what is the optimal sample complexity for uh, robust back learning? So in summary, in this work we show that there, is a, uh, there are VC classes uh, that can't be robustly pack learned if we restrict ourselves to proper learning rules. And then in the second result we show that for any uh, VC class and any adversary U, we can robustly pack learn it with an improper learning rule. And the takeaway message is that we should start considering uh, improper learning rules uh, for adversarially robust uh, generalization. Thank you all for sticking around. Yeah. Thank you.